uh, I want to make sure we, we, we lay this out here. This is a significant decision from the U.S. Supreme Court about 30 minutes ago on the Texas uh, abortion law. The Supreme Court ruled essentially two things here. It's a mixed verdict, but ruled that the abortion providers in the state of Texas can continue to challenge in court the fetal heartbeat law that passed, the SB8 that passed. But there was a split ruling on this, as we mentioned. In a five to four ruling, the court will not allow the lawsuits to go forward against state court clerks. The abortion providers had, su had sued state court clerks in order to stop this law from taking effect. So a split ruling here this morning. Let's get to uh, one of our guests this morning, Brian Owsley. He's the associate professor of law at UNT in Dallas. Brian, can you hear me this morning? I can, yes. First takeaway from this. I have a number of questions on it. I'm sure our, our, our viewers do too, but first takeaway on this. What do you think? First takeaway on this is it's not a good decision uh, if you care about uh, Roe versus Wade. This is a, a decision that basically uh, in many ways refuses to uphold uh, the court's precedent in Roe versus Wade. Um, and, uh, and that doesn't bode well um, most notably for Dobbs uh, versus Jackson Women's uh, Health, which is the other Supreme or abortion decision that the Supreme Court heard argument earlier this month on. And, and it doesn't bode well for uh, the Roe versus Wade uh, ruling from 72 or 73, simply because I, I don't know if I mentioned SB8 can stand right now in Texas. The Supreme Court did, did not. Uh, uh, strike down SB8. So 39 days after Texas went to D.C. on November the 1st to go ask uh, for an expedited hearing, the justices came back and they said, you know what, SB8 is going to stand. We're going to allow these uh, the, the prohibition on abortions beyond six weeks or so whenever a fetal heartbeat is detected. That seems significant. You mentioned Roe v. Wade. That was one of my questions. D does this continue to chip away at that landmark decision? Yes, it does. It, it, uh, I mean, I think chip away might uh, we might be seeing the end of Roe versus Wade in the in the coming uh, months with uh, the one two punch of this decision and Dobbs. Um, I would say that uh, what as I understand it, what the decision does vis a vis Roe and SB8 is it doesn't issue a stay. In other words, uh, the state of Texas is still allowed to enforce SB8 while abortion providers are allowed to challenge it in court. In other words, uh, many times, for example, let's talk about Dobbs versus uh, Jackson Women's Health. There, the court stayed in light of Roe versus Wade, the trial court and the appellate court upheld um, because of Roe versus Wade. Here, the Supreme Court and the lower courts have not stayed the implementation of SB 8. So in other words, if you are someone in the state of Texas who is seeking an abortion, you are uh, stuck under the rules uh, established in SB 8. And you mentioned Dobbs versus uh, Jackson Women's Health a couple of times. For our, our viewers who might not know that, that's the Mississippi case that essentially uh, was heard right after the Texas case was uh, last month. And, and that one's the one asking for 15 weeks. Go ahead, Brian. Exactly. That's that's a 15 week decision uh, or, or uh, law. And the court heard argument about a month after it heard uh, uh, argument on uh, the one for Texas and, and SB8. The court had decided sometime in the spring to hear argument on Dobbs. So that wasn't uh, any revelation. The court uh, took up the appeal or, uh, uh, in SB8 as an emergency matter. And so um, on some level, we've been waiting quite a while for this decision because of the emergency nature of it. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, we now have that decision going forward and, and I expect we'll get a decision uh, from regarding Dobbs, you know, this term and um, quite, quite possibly uh, we'll no longer have Roe versus Wade as good law. Well, well, lay this out for our viewers here, too. It's, so for now, the SB8 remains the law of the land in Texas women cannot get an abortion beyond six weeks. That is, is 
was not stayed by the court, as you mentioned. So what happens next in this? Because the, the justices did say by an eight to one ruling that these abortion providers who are suing over this can continue their cases. What happens next with these cases then? So uh, the uh, providers will go back and they will find the appropriate individuals to sue <coughs> uh, and go forward with cases uh, challenging Roe versus Wade. This was, <coughs> uh, I think for uh, some background, SB8 was a very um, distinct statute in the sense of what it did was try to prevent the law from being challenged in federal court. And I think that's why you see so many of the justices giving pause. For example, Justice Kavanaugh during oral argument regarding SB8 was very concerned about the approach that the state of Texas had taken in enacting the law and noted that potentially <clears throat> legislatures in um, maybe blue states could take a similar approach to limit uh, gun rights and uh, target uh, gun owners. And so maybe the state of New York or the state of California could use this approach. And so I think on some level, the state of Texas was thumbing its nose at sort of federal courts and federal judiciary power. And that's never going to be a great recipe for success uh, at the Supreme Court. They're going to guard their ability to um, basically review consistent with Marbury versus Madison uh, matters before the court. And so, uh, and challenges uh, regarding the federal constitution. So that's, I think what's driving sort of the eight one decision. <clears throat> but as we've been talking about, there's the abortion component um, that is, is also a, you know, a large part of this, this decision. Yeah, and just to reiterate what you were saying there, the, the thing that made this law so unique and, and so different is the fact that the state did not enforce SB8. Enforcement of SB8 was left up to individuals anywhere. Uh, there were people in, in uh, a man in, in Illinois, a man in Arkansas, both who sued over SB8 simply because the, lo the law allowed them to do that. Uh, I, I asked you what, what happens next here too. People who might be watching this are also saying, hey, I thought I just saw a headline though yesterday uh, from a state court ruling that the enforcement mechanism violates the state constitution. So lay out kind of what's happening here because there are two parallel uh, cases kind of underway right now. One on the federal level, which the Supreme Court uh, offered, you know, some, some guidance on today, and then one on the state level here too, Brian. Exactly. So um, the matter before the Supreme Court that was just decided today concerned litigation in federal court. Uh, starting in federal district court at the trial level, there was the suit by uh, the providers, uh, in that uh, uh, in, in f uh, federal court. And there was also a suit in uh, federal district court by the United States seeking to enforce uh, Roe versus Wade and, and uh, uh, attacking this approach. And so that will go back, those, the, the matter of the providers will go back to federal court and they can start to litigate if they can find uh, proper defendants. Yeah, if they can find the, someone, if they can find someone to sue, you were saying. Go ahead, Brian. No, they, I mean they have to. You know, they, if they can't sue the clerk of the courts, they're going to have to figure out who they can sue. Um, possibly state judges. Um, there was a, a, a concurrence by I think it was Chief Justice Roberts that indicated he thought uh, not only he thought that the clerk of the court could be sued, but he also thought. Um, that the attorney uh, general for the state of Texas uh, could be sued as well. So that will sort of be sorted out, but the, that will that litigation challenging SB8 will go forward in federal court. As you noted, there is a parallel track in state court and um, that will that is proceeding, as you noted with a decision yesterday by one judge. Uh, again, I think judges in, in Texas state court are also probably a little wary of this approach to basically to design a, a system where 
litigation is is uh, uh, foreclosed for uh, anyone to challenge the nature of the statute. Um, so, um, and also, as you noted, <clears throat> at least early on, I don't know if there's been any recent filings, but there was a, a provider out of San Antonio who, who wrote an op-ed and said, I basically violated this law. I provided uh, an abortion for a woman who, uh, who was uh, outside of the six week limit. And that individual was sued by uh, the gentleman from Arkansas who is a disbarred attorney who acknowledged he didn't really have a stake in the abortion fight. He just wanted money. And uh, there was another gentleman outside of Texas who uh, sued uh, as well, who I think characterized themselves as someone who was in favor of a woman's right to uh, abortion access. And so he was just sort of trying to challenge it to uh, move things along. And then uh, so part of I think the state judges might be wary of uh, is that anyone and everyone's just coming in suing everywhere anywhere it's it's pretty loosey-goosey on some level and that's that could give pause to a number of state judges who just think it's it's not well designed and, and maybe problematic putting aside the question of roe versus wade but for procedural uh reasons uh, pursuant to texas state law let me just reset for our viewers who might be watching us now. We're speaking to Brian Owsley. He's the associate professor of law at UNT Dallas. We're, we're, we're on here digitally because the U.S. Supreme Court about 45 minutes ago ruled that abortion providers in the state of Texas, they can challenge the Texas law, SB 8, that bans abortions after a fetal heartbeat is detected about uh, six weeks in. But the Supreme Court left that law in place while these legal challenges continue. We just got a tweet also here from uh, Whole Women's Health. This is one of the plaintiffs involved. And the tweet says, the takeaway from SCOTUS, we won on very narrow grounds. Our lawsuit can continue against the health department, medical board, nursing board, and pharmacy board. We'd hope for a statewide injunction, but no clear path to it. Rest assured, we will not stop fighting. We aren't entirely sure what's going to happen. It's disappointing SB8 is so blatantly cruel and unconstitutional, and the court has decided not to grant us relief. While we hold out hope for the rest of our lawsuit, the court still failed, failed us today. So what you hear from that, from Whole Women's Health, is essentially that mixed verdict, the split ruling, because the, the justices, as you know, we want to reiterate here, did say <coughs> that the law can stand while abortion providers continue to uh, challenge this in court, but they will not let the justices in a five to four decision said, you can find somebody else to sue essentially here because you cannot sue the court clerks in all 254 counties across the state. Brian, I want to come back to you for, for one, one last thought on this. A as we look forward, as people are digesting this news and as both sides are trying to figure out exactly what the entire ruling says, because it's a pretty thick one here, what should we be watching for next? Well, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, we've talked about the, the parallel track of these two decisions or two, you know, state court and federal court litigation. So um, as you heard from the tweet from uh, Jackson Women's Whole, uh, Health, uh, or, uh, they're, they're going back to uh, um, um, they're going back to uh, court. Um, as they characterized it as a, a very, very narrow victory for them. The, the victory for them is they get the right to go back to court and proceed with their challenge to SB 8. Um, the problem is, as they noted, uh, SB 8 is still uh, the law of Texas now. Uh, and so it is impacting uh, women's right to have access to abortion services. And so uh, they probably want to get in court as quickly as possible and challenge it as quickly as possible. I doubt that they're going to get, be able to go back and get injunctive relief in light of the decision by the Supreme Court. So they're going to have to go and attack on the merits and uh, get it done as quickly as possible. Uh, in light of Dobbs, there's a lot of flux. So um, I, think, I think the court can uphold the Mississippi statute in Dobbs and still strike this one down, but we'll have to see what happens in Dobbs. Um, and, and I say that because 15 weeks is considerably longer than six weeks. 
obviously. And um, so, so there is, there is some wiggle room there, but um, if you are someone who supports a woman's right to abortion, this is not a great decision. Um, and there is concern about Dobbs on the horizon. And, and just to re- reiterate again, you keep mentioning Dobbs. That's the Mississippi case. But you think you, you just mentioned something there that I, I want to expand on just a, just a moment or final uh, seconds here too. You said that the, the court might be willing to let the Mississippi case uh, stand, which would ban abortions after 15 weeks, and then strike down the Texas case. How might that happen? So uh, again, uh, it's always uh, dangerous to read tea leaves, but right. uh, the court in the oral argument of Dobbs seemed, if you start counting justices, seems to be inclined to uphold um, Dobbs. Now, before the court was not the express this question of whether or not Roe versus Wade should be overturned. Um, but in order to uphold Dobbs on some level, you have to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, and, uh, but if the statute in, in Mississippi is upheld, then uh, basically the limit is down to 15 weeks in the state of Mississippi. Um, and so you could see potentially, depending on the language in any uh, decision by Dobbs, where 15 weeks might be an acceptable uh, point for the court, whereas six weeks, uh, the language in the decision may not support something as limited as six weeks. Um, let, let me, my, my concern is is that the court uh, is either in Dobbs or in subsequent decisions going to basically just say there is no right to an abortion. And we heard, for example, uh, Justice Kavanaugh uh, basically arguing for neutrality uh, i.e. Uh, can't be either pro or anti-abortion. Um, and so, uh, but that there is that gap between the 15 and 6, and that's how possibly you could have, have that happen. But Professor, if, if, Professor Owsley, if, if the 15 weeks, if the Mississippi, Mississippi case stands and the 15 weeks becomes the law of the land, there's a, there's a trigger law in the state of Texas that would make it happen here immediately as well, too, where the state of Texas would adopt that. But but if that happens, the the time limit for Roe versus Wade, the 26 weeks, that, that would be reduced down to 15 weeks. Could, could someone say that Roe versus Wade no longer exists because the, the time limit has changed? Um, well, so I think what would happen with the any upholding of the Mississippi statute is, uh, yes, Roe versus Wade has sort of uh, talks about uh, first trimester, and then I think right. Casey uh, versus Planned Parenthood uh, talks about uh, 24 weeks and stuff like that. The problem in upholding the Mississippi statute would be essentially that the court was jettisoning the approach of viability, okay, which was. Uh, what I think the core holding of Roe versus Wade, especially after Casey existed. In other words, a woman would have a right to have an abortion uh, before the fetus was viable. Uh, Once it was viable, then states had uh, rights uh, or the ability to protect rights on behalf of the fetus and uh, could uh, basically enact laws that would limit abortions after viability. But at 15 weeks, it's uh, accepted that 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 fetus is not viable. And so in order for the Mississippi statute to be upheld, you would essentially have to, uh, the court would have to jettison the viability approach, which is uh, really the core of Roe versus Wade now. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks for clarifying that. This is certainly a Supreme Court term to be watching. Uh, the term is up in the uh, in the summer, so there's a lot to, that we should be watching for between now and then, and when the term is up, which is obviously when a lot of the decisions uh, are, are are handed down too. That's Brian Owsley. He's the associate professor uh, of law at UNT Dallas. Brian, we'll be calling you back, I'm sure, as we try to put all the pieces together on this. But thanks for the time this morning. Thank you. You all have a good day. Appreciate it. And just to reiterate to our viewers exactly what happened here about 52 minutes ago, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ruled that abortion providers, they can legally challenge SB 8. 
but it's important here what they said. They said they're going to let SB8 stand. It remains the law of the land in Texas. You cannot get an abortion beyond six weeks, but the abortion provider still can pursue lawsuits on this. But until they find a defendant and go forward in a court and, and try to get this overturned, SB8 remains the law of the land in Texas. We're still putting some other um, uh, eyes and ears and uh, trying to make sure we understand this thing, putting eyes and ears on this case and this decision that came down within the last hour. We're going to have an update on WFAA midday in about an hour or so. I hope you can join us then. Take care.